Hi again, I'm Brian Smith. I am a faculty in biomedical engineering at Michigan State. Um, and I, uh, my connection to Sam is I did my postdoctoral research with him. And it's uh, my pleasure today to introduce Todd Coleman. Uh, Professor Coleman received his bachelor's degrees in electrical and computer engineering from the University of Michigan. Uh, then after being awarded his PhD from MIT in electrical engineering, he did his postdoc at MIT in neuroscience. Now he's the U Family Faculty Scholar uh, in the School of Engineering, and he's an Associate Professor uh, in the Department of Bioengineering at Stanford. Uh, Dr. Coleman's highly multidisciplinary research uh, employs tools from applied probability, uh, physiology, bio and bioelectronics. And his research spans the development uh, from the development of fundamental information theory and machine learning techniques uh, to, develop, to developing various technologies in the brain and visceral organs. Um, he was a National Academy of Engineering Gilbreth, Gilbreth Lecturer, uh, a, a fellow of the IEEE, and a fellow of the uh, American Institute uh, for Medical and Biological Engineering. Um, he's currently chair of the National Academy's uh, Standing Committee on Biotechnology Capabilities and National Security Needs. And so I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Coleman to speak to us today uh, about the electrophysiology of the digestive system and its technologies therein. Thanks, Dr. Coleman. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, hopeful that uh, everyone can uh, see uh, uh, my screen. So a little bit about myself, uh, as it was alluded to, my PhD work was in electrical engineering with an emphasis on applied probability. Uh, my PhD advisor gave me the best piece of advice uh, in my career, which she strongly encouraged me to do my postdoctoral study in something wildly different. And so I ended up doing a postdoctoral study uh, in neuroscience with Emory Brown. I call this an experience of feeling comfortable, feeling uncomfortable, because I hadn't taken a biology class since AP biology in high school. And here I was in a neuroscience lab. Uh, what made this experience particularly rewarding and beneficial for me was that Emory, although he's a practicing anesthesiologist and neuroscientist, uh, he has a PhD in statistics. So I was be able to learn neurophysiology through the language of probability and statistics. Uh, when I began my career, I began to operate at the intersection of not only neuroscience and, and applied probability, but also uh, technology development. And so some examples of things that we've been doing is we still actually do active work in sort of the pure probability dating back to the topics of my PhD that is particularly relevant right now because we're in the scope of big data, so very high dimensional uh, situations. Uh, we have developed uh, technologies like sensor, uh, sensors that are thin and flexible and stretchable that can mount right onto the, the human skin. Uh, then lastly, we've applied these, for instance, within the context of um, probabilistic sleep staging to envision wearing a patch on your head that can extract not only EEG brainwave signals, but then interpret them to determine the stages of sleep to determine whether or not you have sleep apnea. So that was my career trajectory at some point, and then sometimes problems become opportunities. And what I mean by that is that I lost, this is a picture of me and my father at a family reunion, and in 2011, I lost him to pancreatic cancer. And so it turns out that he had lost his mom to stomach cancer. So I saw this history of the problems of the digestive system in my family. And in the spirit of feeling comfortable, feeling uncomfortable, I decided that I was going to steer some of my research in a new direction and to explore the digestive system. And so at the very beginning, when we took a look at the digestive system, you see someone with uh, common symptoms of things like pain, nausea, bloating, constipation, and then you can have a multitude of different um, underlying conditions. And what's particularly interesting about this is that these different conditions, some of them, the, the underlying causes of them can be different. And also the optimal treatments to improve your symptoms can be very different, despite the fact that the symptoms are quite overlapping. And that is what, you know, is not surprising that it costs about 150 billion U.S. dollars in annual costs. Second most common reason someone misses school or work after the common cold. So, uh, you know, me being an electrical engineer, uh, I wanted to ask myself, although I want to feel comfortable feeling uncomfortable, I wanted to make sure there's an electrical story. And it wasn't obvious at first glance, because when you think about the digestive system, you think chemistry, because the acids in your stomach breaking foods down, you think mechanics, because the process of peristalsis and the smooth muscle cells, etc. But is there an electrical story? And so by, by poking around, uh, we learned that it turns out the answer is yes. And in particular, our, our digestive system. And if we focus on the nervous system of our digestive system, which has about 100 million neurons, turns out it is connected to our, our, our um, 
uh, our, our, our central nervous system via uh, the vagus nerve and the spinal cord. And these are electrical connections with standard neurophysiology. And so I began to get very intrigued about this underlying uh, electrophysiology of the digestive system and the connection with the enteric nervous system or 100 million neurons in our gut. So uh, one of the things that we discovered is that there are these uh, pacemaker cells uh, throughout our, our digestive tract and they have... Um, these, I, I like to call these the neuromuscular maestros because they coordinate information coming from the enteric nervous system, all those 100 million neurons, and they provide information to the smooth muscle cells to create, to modulate the likelihood of them contracting. And what's exciting about them is they operate as a traveling wave. So the membrane potentials uh, oscillate up and down uh, irrespective of whether or not action potentials are generated. And so this creates uh, optimal timing of when the action potentials will get generated for these cells. And this gives rise to sequencing of contractions. So the high level vision that we had was uh, since this electrical activity occurs, can we take what the EEG has done for the brain, what the EKG has done for the heart and do something analogous uh, for the gut? And so, to, you know, to fast forward, it turns out that the answer is yes. And so our first publication on this was in 2017. And we showcased that with a multi-electrode array over the surface of the abdomen, if you plug uh, those electrodes into a standard EEG-like amplifier, you can actually uh, cover this electrical wave-like activity that occurs in the stomach. And then we can, you know, put on my applied probability hat and develop appropriate approaches, looking at wave statistics, directions that things are occurring to come up with a spatial histogram of what direction are the waves propagating. And a high level hypothesis that we had is that if you take a look at patients who have bad symptoms, some of these symptoms are going to correlate with slow waves not propagating downward towards the small intestines. And so it turns out that our hypothesis in some sense was correct in that if you take a look at human controls, as you see on the left, you see that the wave is prim primarily propagating downward towards the small intestines. If you look at the CT scan of the subject, you see that uh, towards the small intestines is approximately 180 degrees. When we build a spatial histogram of what direction the waves are going, it's primarily going in that direction. If we take a look at a patient who has delayed gastric emptying or gastroparesis, what you notice is that, again, towards the small intestines in this location is still approximately 180 degrees, but we have these waves propagating in all these aberrant directions, almost everywhere except 180 degrees. So with that, we built a very simple uh, regression-like plot where we looked at the percentage of time that you had slow waves that were propagating in an abnormal direction, and that's on the horizontal axis. And we wanted to compare that against a clinically indicated symptom score that is routinely used uh, clinically in the GI field and the high level ideas and give a patient a question about how bad is your upper, you know, your upper GI symptoms, your lower GI symptoms, your pain, your constipation. And you turn all of, all of those scores into a number between zero and five, the closer to zero, the fewer the symptoms, the closer to five, the more severe the symptoms. And lo and behold, what we found was that all of the human controls had a small number of abnormal slow waves and also, not surprising, did not have bad symptoms. And we saw a correlation across the whole span of things. And what was exciting about this was that this was the first work that was a uh, non-invasive uh, measure of uh, gastric function that actually correlated with the severity of symptoms. And there had been many previous objective measures that unfortunately did not correlate with symptom severity. So we wanted to go one step further and not just correlate with symptom severity, but can we actually have cover in some situations, whether or not certain types of treatments will work or not. So really wearing our um, uh, more serious machine learning and applied probability hat, we're able to use some modern techniques from optimal transport and other applied probability topics. We we're actually able to, in some sense, refine uh, this regression approach and to, to start to take a look at subjects where their symptom severity exceeds what we would have predicted based upon the abdominal recordings. And in some of those patients, we actually had repeat questionnaires before and after my clinical colleague did an intervention. And to make a long story short, we basically can predict, or, 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 or so far, based upon the findings we have so far, it predicts whether or not certain types of treatments will be effective, which is quite exciting. So uh, moving one step forward, we wanted to go beyond using a $30,000 EEG amplifier system and take advantage of the brain initiative that had been developed for all these portable technologies. And we basically wrote our surfboard over the wave of innovation of the brain initiative and built a portable device. 
And so these portable devices, we implemented artifact rejection algorithms, uh, techniques to extract the information about the stomach, uh, which is a very low frequency, uh, uh, and a variety of other details. And some of the types of things that we're able to extract is taking a look at uh, when a meal occurs, we can take a look at the energy and the frequency band associated with the stomach. To what extent does it increase after a meal? And how does it increase and then decrease? And we can also get detailed descriptions about what the human subject ate, et cetera. We can also extract spatial statistics about this. And one thing to emphasize here is that this is not done during a 90 minute visit in the clinic. This is now in the comfort of your home, own home where you're annotating symptoms with a smartphone app that we also provided as a companion device. So in the comfort of your home, your home, getting more realistic information. And one of the key questions that we wanted to ask is which symptoms are associated with these gastric neuromuscular abnormalities because not all symptoms necessarily are. So we wanted to go one step further and to leverage some of this novel technology that we had developed for um, for the thin, stretchable, uh, flexible electronics. And so in that regard, we, uh, uh, we, it, it took uh, some non-trivial efforts to do this, including using some, um, not the standard techniques that we use in the clean room. And the, the reason we had to do this is because the stomach signal is a very low frequency signal, 0 0.05 Hertz. So some of the standard chemistry that's used in the clean room doesn't work, but lo and behold, with the smart postdoc, we were able to pull this off. And uh, we now have a thin, flexible, stretchable patch that you can place right on the abdomen, which is a multi-electrode array. And it turns out we can locate the stomach with a portable ultrasound device. And the reason that's important is because unlike a 12 lead EKG, it turns out everyone's stomach relative to their belly button or their bottom of their rib cage can be very different. So we first can use a portable ultrasound device that you can plug into an iPhone, locate the stomach, then apply the patch. And we're able to showcase that you get analogous information in terms of an increase in activity after a meal uh, the dominant frequency is 0 0.05 hertz in all the subjects. And you see an increase in activity after a meal as compared to previously. So <clears throat> uh, another direction that we wanted to go, just like how we have in the heart and just like we have in the brain, in the heart, we have pacemakers. In the brain, we have brain stimulators. Suppose that we determine that someone has these some gastric neuromuscular abnormalities. Are there interesting opportunities to develop pacing technologies? Well, it turns out there is a pacing technology that's only FDA approved for humanitarian purposes. And it's basically a standard pacemaker with a lead and whatnot. And we got interested in innovating in this direction. And so one of the things we were able to develop with my graduate student, Andrew, here at Stanford is um, to basically develop a leadless uh, pacing device where we power the pacing device with inductive coupling. And so uh, the high level idea is you, you can even inject this in something like a, a, a large vein, something along those lines. And, uh, and then we can have the transmitter coil that's placed uh, either subcutaneously or even just on the surface of the skin that can power this device. And we did the study in pigs and uh, some exciting things that we were able to show is with pulse widths of 400 milliseconds uh, and with all the information within the SAR restrictions of, of, of doing a, a wireless power transfer, uh, we were able to accomplish this. And what I mean by accomplish this is that we were able to um, basically entrain the direction of the slow wave after pacing as compared previously. And what I mean by that is that this red vertical line corresponds to when the pacing began. And what you can see is the wave direction relative to the cutaneous recordings up top around the skin and the wave direction relative to recordings right on the stomach surface. So the bottom almost represents the ground truth and the top represents what we record from the skin. What's exciting is after uh, about uh, 20 minutes or so, you start to see the pacing is entraining the slow wave towards the standard direction. And what's also exciting is we, we in some sense capture the same information when we look cutaneously, especially as measured by the green signal representing the variance and the direction. What's also exciting about having these cutaneous electrodes is that you can imagine closed loop systems where when you turn the pacing on or off uh, depends upon the information you're reading, uh, you're reading here. So this is an exciting uh, direction, uh, some of the exciting directions that we're moving towards. And as we moved to Stanford, I just moved to Stanford about a year ago. Uh, Wayne Gretzky has a famous quote, I don't skate towards where the puck is, I skate towards where the puck is going. And so, and knowing that we were going to be at this new, um, new, new neuroscience building at Stanford, I got interested in exploring. Uh, I've done a lot of brain science earlier on in my career. We've done this gastrointestinal science uh, and really trying to help people with GI symptoms. What can we do moving forward? 
as I mentioned before, we know that the brain and the gut are electrically connected, you know, from the microbiome and everything else. People have told us about serotonin, you know, short chain fatty acids, the whole story about the microbiome. But if we focus electrically, what we now can measure electrically from the stomach, we can measure electrically from the brain. What happens if we do both simultaneously? And so we've begun studies in doing that. And I'll share with you one preliminary finding that's under review right here. Basically, what we're able to show is that there is a, um, we can record non-invasively using you know, standard EEG and standard gastric non-invasive monitoring. You can uncover this coupling between the gut and the brain. Uh, and what we also did is we developed uh, some different cognitive tasks to determine um, if that, amp that, that phase amplitude coupling between the stomach and brain is all, is it all modulated. And so at a very high level, without boring you with all the details, we were able to show is that indeed during working memory tasks, um, we see an increase in the nature of the phase amplitude coupling with the underlying behavioral speed. So uh, this is you know, a wide open area of research that we are gonna be uh, diving into as we're exploring more about the electrophysiologic basis of, of the gut-brain axis. Uh, and so as I conclude, I'd just like to share a little bit about our research philosophy and I call it Red Ocean, Blue Ocean, where uh, uh, cutthroat competition in existing industries uh, taints the ocean bloody red, whereas uh, uh, Blue Ocean represents areas that are um, underexplored, vast opportunities for growth, and um, you can do so at a comfortable pace where you don't have to look over your shoulder and quick refresh on Google Scholar every moment. <laughs> So with that, I, uh, I conclude my talk. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for that intriguing talk, Todd. Um, modulating the, the gut and, and reading its electrical, its electrical signals. Um, super, super interesting. Um, let me check the latest for uh, questions. Yeah, please ask questions to Dr. Coleman if you have them. Um, I guess one question that I had is, um, so if, uh, you know, it, for guts, you know, you, you have, uh, guts of all types. Can you keep kind of an electrical eye on guts on whether you're, you know, sort of Mr. Universe have a few extra pounds or, or even if you're pregnant, I mean, does the electrical reading kind of work through no matter what you're dealing with there? That's an excellent question. So in our 2019 clinical publication, uh, one of the questions that was asked by the reviewers is how robust is this electrical measure um, to uh, things like BMI, as you alluded to. And so in that regard, we had you know, even up to BMIs in the, 40, in, in, in the 30s, we were able to demonstrate our ability to do this. Pregnancy is another interesting question. I, I've, been, you know, work, I've worked on abdominal recording technologies for pregnancy. Uh, for, for starters, we have not... Um, explored the connection with pregnancy yet but that is definitely something that can be explored so would you be measuring the the fetus gut that's what not what i meant mean? that's interesting right that's interesting <laughs> you know there's this whole topic now of fetal neuroscience right and yeah trying to measure fetal brains that is not what i meant i thought maybe you were wondering is does the presence of the fetus at all fetus at all serve as uh a disturbance to the signal we're trying to measure. I thought maybe that was your question. That was my although first we question. have not collected, <laughs> yeah, although we have not collected data on that, my hypothesis is no, because um, the, the the signal in the stomach, these pacemaker cells, they oscillated very low frequencies, zero point zero five hertz. And so, basically, what we're just measuring is, um, well, first of all, we're measuring an, an array of them. Uh, each of them oscillate at the same frequency. The array captures different spatial locations. And we care about the nature of the phase relationships with respect to space so we can determine, determine direction. But we also care about when the oscill oscillations are large versus small, because that tells us something about if excitatory or inhibitory inputs from the autonomic nervous system or the enteric nervous system are modulating things. Those things are all primarily focused in a narrow and very low frequency band. And mm -hmm. so for that reason, I would hypothesize that even during pregnancy, um, you would still be able to measure them, but I cannot confirm that because we haven't done that. <laughs> Even with all the movement of organs and uh, yeah, in, in pregnant. So the movement's an interesting question. So, you know, especially if you're talking about the latter stages of pregnancy, then there's definitely be some interesting movement questions. Uh, um, so uh, I agree it's a challenge, but it could be a fun signal processing opportunity nonetheless. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Um, so we have a, a question on Slido. Uh, 
the breadth of your training seems to correlate with the breadth of your ability to transfer and translate insights into uh, varied lines of inquiry and, and creativity. Have you incorporated this approach in building your labs, recruiting students and, and postdocs or faculty recruitment? So I, I definitely uh, share that mindset. You know, I've, I've, I was trained in multiple things. I, um, it's something I think about a lot because my training actually, although I ultimately ended up having training in many things, I did it in a sequential process. When I was doing my PhD in electrical engineering, I was unapologetically studying applied probability, wireless communications. Some of my friends that were MD, PhD students were doing biomedical engineering. I didn't care about that. They were like, why don't you take this stuff and benefit mankind? At that moment, I was focused on doing a deep dive there. Then my PhD advisor gave me the best piece of advice in my career, do the postdoc in something wildly different. And I did it in neuroscience. That's when I began to expand. And then similarly, you know, the GI and the technology development, those things happened later. So my training has been sequential. So I, I use that as a, um, as a reminder to some of my trainees that if you uh, don't always just pay attention to the outcome, to pay attention to the path that people took. And I'm not necessarily saying that you should only do this and not do that. Uh, but I, I like to encourage my students to get a very strong fundamental training in something. And then we can start to build it on. But without question, my research lab, uh, especially the postdocs, I love to get postdocs in areas that are very different than mine because it's an opportunity for me to learn. It's an opportunity to expand. Uh, and even some of my PhD students, so I have PhD students not only in bioengineering, but you know, material science, obviously electrical engineering, that's my original training. And, you know, one of my former postdocs who's now a research staff with a PhD in biology. So I really like to um, use, uh, yeah, yeah, lab as an opportunity to create this very interdisciplinary viewpoint. Although I encourage everyone to, to you know, to remember uh, not to do, not to try to do too much in too short a period of time. Yeah. <clears throat> Great advice. Uh, so, um, you, you get your breath by a series of in-depth dives. Uh, at least that's what you've done in your career. Oh, that, that was my experience. That was my experience. Um, uh, I've, you know, I've had, uh, you know, I have some students who really, you know, want to attempt to do it all. And so I, I encourage them, let's be patient. But the way I think about it is portfolio optimization. You can maybe have a portfolio of many topics. But it cannot be like 33%, 33%, 33%. I want to see like a 60, 20, 20 or something along those lines. And then little by little later on, you can expand. So that, that's just the high level advice I give to my students. And I do love their, their excitement about really trying to operate this intersection. And I think that people who do do that have a unique opportunity when they go towards being a faculty member because, you know, the the bread and butter days of like the, you know, the best achievements in physics or the best achievements in some of these disciplines where it was very narrow, although there are still some opportunities there, it appears to be not as common, but it appears where a lot of interesting opportunities appear to be are to take people with strong fundamental training who have a willingness to get a little uncomfortable and to take that training and move it into these emerging areas. And so if you've already had an experience doing that, it can, it has the potential to help you, you know. Great advice, Dr. Bowman. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for your thanks for your great talk um, and guidance. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.